Today's talk is going to be on how to build an accessible and inclusive metaverse. Um, I'm Jamie Beekoff Brett, lovely to meet you all here. It's been fantastic to kind of connect with people in this space. My background actually was as a youth worker for a charity um, that supported me when I was a teenager and the charity supports young people who face marginalization into employment, education and training. For all of my sins of being supported by them, I then went on to work for them for six years, um, including doing things like designing the STEM strategy across the UK to support young people who are often academically excluded, who come from backgrounds where uh, they don't have the same advantages as other people into a sector that is quite academic, quite often elitist, and how can we bridge the gap when they're searching for talent, but these young people can't get into it. Um, so at the moment, I work as an independent consultant supporting organizations, really with what I just like to call the art of the possible. At the moment, there's very much a case of going, if people hear about all these new technologies and how they work, and I go to organizations and say, hey, let's map out everything that you do. That could be AI, that could be automated, this could be a metaverse event, and put them all together. So I think at the, at the moment, the biggest experience I have is a uh, that probably about three times a week I get somebody call me up and go, I want to do something in the metaverse. I'm like, great, what do you want to do in the metaverse? And they go, what is the metaverse? <laughs> and it's very hard to sell something to an organization where they're not sure what they're buying to begin with. Um, so hopefully as we go through this presentation, I realize that we have a range of different levels of expertise and knowledge. So I apologize if any of it you're going, I already knew that, Jamie. Also, I tried to make it as feasible for organizations to take away to say, these are practical frameworks, this is how you can utilize them, and really boil it down into a very simplified way of being able to understand it. So it's not from an academic perspective, but hopefully it will give you some ideas on frameworks that if you're talking to organizations, that you could take them away, take away points from this presentation, more than happy to send out and use it for your conversations as well. So, just want to spend a couple of minutes here just thinking about these questions. You'll see there's some nice fill in the blanks and I will read them out as well. Um, so I want you to think about the answers to these questions. So the first one is approximately what percentage of the US general consumers, Gen Z to Gen X, rate their digital identity as important as their real world identity? The second question is what rate, what percentage rate of digital ownership, uh, rate digital ownership as important? You're going to notice my dyslexia coming in quite a lot when I'm reading slides, so I apologize in advance. Um, and finally, the last one is what percent are interested in purchasing a digital asset in the next 12 months, whether that is a digital skin or another item in gaming, digital fashion, digital avatar or an NFT? Just spend 30 seconds having a bit of think on that. And then there's no answer to the questions. No, we'll go on to that in a second. Um, so what surprises people, I think, is a, a lot around the social factors and attitudes around digital ownership and, and the metaverse. And we'll see how this ties into accessibility in a second. So 70% of US consumers rate their digital identity as important as their traditional identity showing a massive change in perspective of how important our digital worlds are. We had a lot of conversations yesterday thinking about what happens when people's digital identity and traditional identity don't necessarily align up. And we were talking a lot around avatar customization, um, being able to build, these, build lots of things that represent us within those spaces. And we can see why it's so important because people are coming to a space of reconciling these two separate identities. 65% of people rate digital ownership as important and have a perspective on digital ownership, which I think is incredible when we consider how much that's changed over the last few years, that people are willing to pay for a digital asset because they recognize that it has value. We also have 50% of people are interested in purchasing a digital asset in the next few months, and that particularly relates to things like digital avatar, NFT clothing for avatar, so there is an amazing commercial opportunity here. And people often go to me, so what's different? We, we, we've heard from lots of people that we've had VR technology for about 30 years, and it hasn't really changed significantly within 30 years. We've had AI technology 10 to 15 years, blockchain technology for about 10 to 15 years, if you look at some of the original blockchain aspects. 
So what's different now? Why does all of this matter? And that's because we have a convergence of technology. These technologies do not work just separately from each other now, but they are merging into one interoperable connected network of technology. And that's what's made this opportunity so exciting and so different to what it's ever been before. So we can see around things like avatar design, blockchain, artificial intelligence, all of these things underpin each other in a way that changes the digital landscape. And as much as I love being able to talk about all of these things individually, the main message that I want people to take away from this is there's four kind of key factors that are tying in. Decentralization, which is about how do we distribute um, authority away from centralized institutions. Web3, which reinvents how data moves through those systems. Artificial intelligence that performs tasks that normally a human would. Um, and the metaverse, which is a replatforming of digital experiences. Which creates this lovely little thing called fidgetal. If you haven't come across the term before, I love the term. Fidgetal really refers to that erosion between our physical and our digital worlds in a way that means that they are almost interchangeable. I have a little 3D print of my avatar, which is my favorite example of this, because that is a, a physical version of my digital representation of my physical self. Perfect example of digital. So we've spoken a bit about this, and people, when they ask me, what is the metaverse? And I tried to explain it as a concept, as a, as a high level bit, and this is why I really think it's important when I talk about building the inclusive metaverse that I start off by explaining how it's perceived. It's really this interconnected space of virtual worlds, spaces, assets that are interoperable. So you should be able to take one asset from one place and bring it in to a new one. There's different context for the metaverse as well. And for the record, there isn't a specific example of what the metaverse is at the moment. Um, one aspect, one perspective is a centralized version of it, which is more Meta's perspective on what the metaverse is, which is a centralized one get where it's governed by a centralized protocol. It's administered by a single regulated entity with like a controlled siloed environment with predetermined standards, also known as a closed metaverse. From an accessibility point of view, this could be potentially beneficial because you can do standardization across the same thing. You could bring in protocols that are designed to be more inclusive. Um, however, you also have it regulated by a central authority. So if they don't bring in those protocols or they're not the right standards, that creates challenges within itself. But this is the one that I like. This is the, this is the perspective that I'm working for when it comes to building a metaverse, which is a decentralized version of the metaverse, which is more like the internet style of things, so a decentralized virtual world. Uh, this is where the virtual version of our material world, where there's no predetermined physics. Once again, very important when we're thinking about accessibility, because if we can change the physics, we can change the environment, we can change how somebody experiences that environment. So this would be community-owned, community-governed, freely interoperable, with privacy built in, aka an open metaverse. And just some examples of, of things that we've built within that space in case you're trying to get your head around the visual bit because I'm a very visual thinker. So at the top here, we have just a metaverse space that I've designed for, for training and facilitation that looks at cognitive diversity and it looks at how people have different thinking patterns and essentially color codes them into these different ways of working around the environment. So we can support people by educating them, by tailoring the environment to the content that we're delivering. We've got augmented reality, as you can see there, which is based on the same thing, being able to put people on this whole brain map, and an AI that is able to apply these whole brain thinking perspectives um, to uh, any ch question or any challenge that somebody poses. But if you want to know what all of this means, get away from all of the hype, get away from the challenge. What we're really talking about is the future of the internet and e-commerce. So when you hear metaverse, when you hear AI, when you hear Web3, just think, the future of the internet and e-commerce. So, I would like to kind of go on to the accessibility aspects, and I apologize that uh, I needed to do a lot of floor laying to be able to get to this stage. Uh, so, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed, quote by William Gibson. 
And this is where we start to look at the metaverse. And I've brought up Snow Crash as an example. We heard from yesterday one of the speakers. If you haven't ever read Neil Stevenson's book, Snow Crash, uh, it is essentially where the term the metaverse is coined from. And one of the reasons that I always bring it up is because I think it is a great example of the challenges that we're facing for accessibility when it comes to building a metaverse. Because within Neil Stevenson's book, Snow Crash, what you see is that digital in well, inequities in human capital that we experience in the physical world are not just, trans uh, not just transferred across the digital worlds, but magnified within them. And that's one of the biggest challenges that we face when it comes to building an inclusive metaverse is how can we make sure that we're not magnifying those inequalities in those virtual spaces. The problem is that as soon as, as every time the power of the internet increases, those who are already experiencing um, marginalization will fall further and further behind. And we'll have a look at a model for being able to look at that in a second. So. It just said 34 minutes there, and I was like, I have not just been talking for five minutes. <laughs> Panic moments then. Um, so when we're looking at the importance of building an accessible, inclusive metaverse, I refer people to these statistics. One in five people are disabled, and 99.9% .9 of us will experience some form of disablement within our life. That might just be a broken leg. That might be a twisted ankle, but whatever that will be, will stop you being able to participate within certain spaces. That could be you know, down to eyesight, all sorts of different aspects. Participation, so from a, a, a disabled experience point of view, 73% of potential customers experience barriers on more of a quarter than a quarter of the websites that they visit, which is, when you're thinking about how much of a loss that is from a participation perspective, this, it, we haven't even solved this within a Web2 internet world, and now we're moving into a virtual 3D envisioning of the internet, and that has obviously much bigger connotations within those spaces. Then we've also got exclusion. So 75% of people and their families have walked away from a business because of poor accessibility and customer service. Once again, once the power of the internet increases, the more challenges that we experience from an accessibility point of view, the harder it is for people to be able to participate. However, I always talk to businesses about the opportunities that come with this as well. Uh, disabled people have an ever-increasing spending power, so, uh, two, uh, 274 billion per year in the UK, to UK businesses, and in the States, disabled people control 65 billion, uh, six, 645 billion in disposable income. The influence of those is that there is, uh, from a non-disposable income perspective, is actually disabled people can influence over 8 trillion in global purchasing power. If it, anyone wants the frame of reference, that's how much they reckon that it will take to recover from the pandemic. So 8 trillion's worth of wealth and uh, 8 trillion pounds worth of spending power there from, uh, within the, the influence of disabled people. And the price of non-participation costs organizations normally around three times the amount of making those things accessible to begin with. The average cost of a reasonable adjustment is £60. That's in the UK. When, when, you, when, you, might, when, you, write, when you equal it all out, it's about £60. So I'm going to talk through some models that you are probably more aware of and probably come across, um, but mainly because I want to introduce the third one at the end of it. So, the medical model is how we quite often work at the moment. If you look at the language, even within the states, within the Equalities Act, it all falls around the medical model, which is all around essentially fixing the individual. We don't, we're not going to fix the environment, we're not going to make things more accessible, we're going to make things different for the individual instead. Um, and we do this because we tend to fixate on comparing contrasts and uh, people against the norm. When we were talking about avatar designs yesterday, this was a factor that came up quite often, is we were always comparing it to a sense of norm. Um, and also, we always put the responsibility on those individuals to participate. And this model was essentially designed from a medical perspective to be able to go, this is how we're going to diagnose, to fix, to try and sort, because that's the way that the medical mindset works. However, we can move to the social model, which is where a lot of our, our perspectives on disability are 
evolving and where we are trying to move this mindset to. So the social model says that an individual is prevented from participating because of the way that society is organized. And this is reflective with it both within our physical worlds as much as it is within our digital world. Um, so pe barriers that people could be re uh, affected by relate to attitude, policy, physical access, amongst other barriers. So barriers prevent participation rather than any form of diversity. For example, if you have, a wheel uh, if you have ramps for your building, someone is able to participate. You don't necessarily need to be in a wheelchair to benefit from needing a ramp. You could, once again, twisted your ankle. You could have some kind of challenge that stops you from a mobility perspective of getting into the building. So it's around designing things around the spaces that everyone benefits from, everyone can participate from. And the responsibility relies on society for ensuring that it is inclusive for everyone, because if society was different and inclusive, then everyone would be able to participate. And this is one of the key messages that I try to take away when we're teaching organizations to build these metaverse spaces, is are they designing it to be inclusive so everyone can participate? However, we could take this one step further as well. And this is for, this is for your optimistic organizations that really want to buy into it. Uh, this is the celebratory model. So the celebratory model follows lots of similarities to the social model, but it acknowledges that everybody has a unique set of skills and talents that should be embraced. That barriers experienced by an individual should be removed with ease without having to prove that they need it. And this is one of the differences between the social and, and our celebratory, is we often only fix things if somebody can prove that there's a challenge to begin with. So when we go into an organization, we're going, well, we'll do this reasonable adjustment, but you need this doctor's note, and actually you're going to have to have X, Y, and Z in order to be able to get this bit. And let's be honest, I don't know if anyone's experienced reasonable adjustment in the workplace, but nobody wants to be reasonably adjusted. Nobody wants to come into a workplace and go, I want a reasonable adjustment. The difference is when we do it from a celebratory perspective is we accommodate preference and not just ability. And this is what I was very happy when I was listening to the panel beforehand when they were talking, was around we can all benefit from accommodations that are designed to accommodate marginalized people. Uh, for example, if we were, I used the example yesterday of the remote control. The remote control was designed to support people with mobility challenges to change the television. Um, yet, Everybody's probably used a remote control. I've got one in my hand right now. You know, but it, everyone can benefit from the inception of these technologies. And the responsibility is we can all benefit from products and services that are designed for a particular variation in human ability. Another example of this, read out loud software. You don't need to need read out loud software to benefit from being able to utilize it on your computer. So this is my little rhyming bit that took me a little bit of time to come up with, but when we, benefit the extre when, we, when we accommodate the extremes, we benefit the mean. And that's where I really think when we're designing these products and we're talking about building an inclusive metaverse, is we want to start by going, actually, what do we need on the further ends of diversity in order to make sure everybody can benefit from these? So I've got a question for people. Just to take a second to think. If you require glasses to improve your eyesight, are you disabled? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for a show of hands in a second, so you're going to have to put your, your mind on the line. Um, so, for those who think that if you need to wear glasses, you would consider that a disability, put your hand up. Ooh, we've got about a 50-50 split. I love it when that happens. Um, interesting. So there's a lot of understanding and, and perspectives that we can take on that. And I'm really glad that in a com conference about disability, we've managed to get a 50-50 split. It makes me feel much better about what I'm about to say. Um, so when we look at the uh, something like wearing glasses, actually, I'm going to go back to this one. Um, when we look at something like wearing glasses, I would look at something like disablement rather than disability. So what are the disabling factors that stop someone being able to participate? And one of the interesting things about glasses is because they address lots of social challenges and barriers to participation, you've removed a lot of the disabling factors from wearing glasses, which means the experience of disablement isn't as much. So the argument around is, 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 is someone who wears glasses disabled, you would go, do they experience disablement? And because something like wearing glasses attach, uh, 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 someone wearing glasses um, 
basically resolves a lot of the challenges to participation, um, I would say that, that it's no longer a disablement within itself. So for example, wearing glasses, there's no attitudinal barrier to wearing glasses. We don't go, people with glasses, terrible people. I've come across them before. I uh, wouldn't go near them. If you've, if you've seen someone with glasses, I would definitely head in the other direction. So there's no negative attitudes attached to wearing glasses. There's not a technological barrier uh, to it. D glasses are widely accessible. Uh, they can be designed and tailored to you as an individual. So we've removed a technological barrier to participation. Financial, affordable. There's opportunities to be able to have programs in place for those who can't afford glasses to still be able to get glasses. Um, and we still make sure that we're able to do social programs that enable that to happen. From a social perspective, we are similar to the attitudinal. We're very accommodating from a social perspective. Uh, we don't go into our workplace and go, do you see the person with glasses in the interview? I'm not sure about them. You know, they're not sure they're the right fit for our organization um, because we've removed some of the, so there's no social barrier there. An enablement barrier. People with glasses are able to, able to participate. Um, we will seek them out when it comes to doing different things. Let's say if it was building VR technology, we would go, hey, we need to look at people's eyesight because we're going to have to change the lenses to be able to make sure that everyone is able to see to utilize the technology. And policy barriers. We don't have any specific policy barriers that stop people with glasses participating. We don't go, you know, our laws are around them. They're not allowed to vote, um, things like that. So we, we have a understanding of removing all of these disablement factors. And this is the framework that I tend to present to organizations when they're trying to build their metaverse worlds, metaverse products, is this aspect of participation. I've got this described in a bit more detail here, but purely because I know some people would probably want to take a picture. So I'll just leave that up for a second, which describes all of these um, aspects in a bit more detail. Cool, I can see camera, cameras down, okay, okay, good. Um, so by starting to shift disability from, uh, from disability to disablement, it means focusing less on fixing individuals and more on fixing the environment in which they participate. And from a metaverse perspective, this means changing our current technology paradigm of how we develop products and services. So if we look at our extractative technology paradigm, um, I think is a very good example of, of most of our Web2 products today, is that they give users what they want, that each tech has good and bads, so that we, uh, who are we to choose what should happen, that we maximize personalization, that, we, that technology is neutral and we obsess over the metrics. Whereas if we're looking at a humane technology paradigm, we respect human vulnerabilities, we minimize harmful externalities. We consciously center values. We create a shared understanding. We support fairness and justice, and we help people to thrive. It was really interesting listening to the talk yesterday um, about um, how, yes, analysis and data and research is all very good, but it is only a snapshot. It isn't, it's as useful as the, the research that came into it, and it is only just a, a figment of it. Some of it helps you shape decisions in a better way, but it's not all-encompassing within its way. I think quite often we've utilized metrics in a way that stop people participating because, like we've said, we can remove certain people from the data because we consider them outliers rather than actually looking to help all. So it really takes a different value system if you want to change the world. This is from an architect called Jack, uh, Jack Fresco, um, who talks a lot about inclusive design and reshaping society around it. And I've always think that this is the mindset shift that we need to be able to have to be able to participate in building an accessible and inclusive metaverse. If anyone wants to be able to learn more, uh, feel free to connect with me. I run a community called Distributed Republic, which also supports people learn about Web3, the metaverse, and AI, and it's designed to talk about resource sharing and give people who wouldn't normally have access to these resources opportunities to be able to thrive in a digital world. But open up to any questions, thoughts, feelings, perspectives. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Hello. Uh, just wanted to push back a little bit on your uh, eyeglass example. Cool. Go um, for it. I love a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, obviously, you know, uh, you haven't considered uh, bullying mm -hmm. in uh, earlier ages because I myself got bullied mm -hmm. a lot. And uh, so there is some, oh, there, there's four eyes, uh, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So that is a real thing yeah. for younger children. Yeah. Um, and secondly, um, using glasses in some situations, you can't then put on certain types of headsets because then your glasses get in the way. You have contacts, but some people can't wear them, et cetera. So that, those are two real examples for that. Definitely. It's not an all-encompassing bit, and there's definitely nuance to it. I use it as a, an overall example to kind of look at how, when we, do, when we do design things for disablement, that we are able to remove a lot more barriers rather than just when we consider things a disability. Quite often, because we consider things a disability, they become outliers and not necessarily part of the norm. And although I know that there's much more nuance than my, my overarching approach, my point was going, can we remove the disable, uh, disabling factors? Um, because then if somebody is able to participate, we are changing the paradigm of what it means to be disabled. And it also accommodates things like preferences. It also accommodates, you know, we can have from a social perspective, some people wear glasses who don't need, wear, need to wear glasses because there can be a positive perspective as well. So it changes our, our lens and our view of how these things work. But not to minimize anyone's experiences at all whatsoever. Uh, this was a fantastic presentation, so thank you for that. And uh, it was interesting to think about the, your, your take on this persuasion, mm -hmm. the persuasive argument, right? Because what you said is that you, this is how you try and make people care about the inclusive metaverse. Um, but it's very much a moral framing, mm -hmm. right? And I'm wondering if you found that that was effective or if you've ever felt that there was a need for an additional type of framing. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, if you're talking to for-profit companies, at least they have a responsibility to their shareholders mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So Yeah, when you tell them that, you know, the, the global spending power of, of disabled people is eight trillion pounds, there's a massive market there. If you encourage participation, then everyone can benefit from that aspect, which I think is, although there is a moral framing here, there is a huge business case for being able to do that. And that's why I want to tie these things together. It's quite often we go, it's just too difficult to do that. We, we don't want to do that. It will take too much effort, too much time, too much resources, and not enough people will benefit. Whereas what I found really interesting about the Cosmonius Hybrid is within this first month, you know, having um, 1.5 million TTS clicks um, on, on certain areas and, and protocols coming back, shows how many people can benefit from it. And once again, that's why I talk to people about this idea of preference rather than ability, because you can all, you're designing features that every user can benefit from. Um, and I find that that kind of helps with the moral framing and gets people on my side to do the things that I think are important and spend that money because I'm going, yeah, there's, there's a business case here that's going to work for you. You're just not, uh, I go to organizations, go, you're just not thinking about the holistic aspect of it. Rather, quite often with technology companies and, and for-profit companies, um, the mindset can be very uh, focused on being the first person to do it um, and to make as much money as possible, uh, rather than doing it in a way that's meaningful and supports the most amount of people. Yep. So thank you for your talk. Um, you said something that made me jump, and then I thought, well, this is really interesting. So you mentioned um, that virtual reality hasn't really changed much in the past 30 years, and I thought, well, 30 years ago, there weren't consumer social VR platforms. The headsets were terrible. Mm -hmm. So some things clearly have changed, yep. but you have something in mind. What, were you, what do you think hasn't changed that's relevant to what we're talking about in the symposium. So when we're looking at VR headsets, I would go the idea of, you know, eyewear goggles that we can see, put two screens on and we can present content to to create a sense of immersion. That's been around for a long time, that concept. And realistically, even though our future, our current headsets are evolving a lot quicker, um, that's only because there is this convergence of other things as well. It wouldn't work without things like the technological infrastructure we're having place. I think things like 5G, are a big driver for this technology because we need to have the infrastructure and the socialization. We wouldn't be having conversations about the metaverse in the way that we are at the moment 
had we not just gone through a pandemic where everyone was separated. So there's social factors. And if we look at even AR design, Google Glass, you know, uh, 10 years ago, although it, my favorite terminology at the time was glass hole, which I still think is one of the best nicknames that's come up with. But the socialization wasn't there. People were much more concerned about their privacy. Is somebody going to be taking a picture of me? I can't see what they can see. So we weren't socialized for that. Whereas nowadays, everyone's walking around a phone, taking pictures of everything. You've got a phone on both hands, making sure you're recording the whole thing as it goes through. You know, and, and people are less concerned about those privacy factors. So although the headset and the experience, I think, has evolved slightly, or you know, relatively dramatically, the concept has stayed the same. But what's really changed now is all of the other factors, other technology and the socialization factors. Hello. Hello. Where are you? Oh, there you are. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. So what caught my attention is about the metaverse. Mm -hmm. I remember in 2020, I was a student in the UK, mm -hmm. it, that time, due to the pandemic, we cannot go out. Mm -hmm. So we were about to have a conference. Mm -hmm. The organizer decided to create a virtual metaverse in which everyone had to participate like an avatar mm -hmm. in, a, in a conference environment. Mm -hmm. So. I did that. I, I imagine myself being an object or something like that, moving around trying to network with others. It was really awkward. Mm -hmm. That was alternative since it was point dynamic. We cannot meet in person. Mm -hmm. But the question is, sometimes, if I'm personally, as a self computer scientist, I ask myself, we are getting deeper and deeper into virtual environment. Mm -hmm. Is this not creating more isolation? Since everyone is now getting more gully to their phone mm -hmm. and the devices, is this not creating more social isolation instead of bringing us together? Mm -hmm. okay. Good question. So just so I can double check that I understand that correctly, um, is things like met the metaverse and immersive technologies creating more socialized isolation because people don't have to participate as much within a physical world? Uh, the answer is complex and nuanced, and if I had a really good answer for it, I'd make a lot more money than I do. Um, so they, we, I could, we could look at this from both perspectives, and we go from a social isolation, social isolation, uh, from a social isolation perspective, um, that being able to, you know, be, participate in virtual immersive worlds can lead someone away from the world, but also that could be incredibly connecting for some people who, from an accessibility point of view, might not be able to leave the house as much. People who are, are, are in remote areas or do not have friendship groups that they can connect with in their local spaces. So in some ways, it can fulfill a social need. What we have to think about, and the reason I look at that, that different paradigm between our current technological development and our human-centered one, is to go, we need to think about that a lot more. And this whole presentation is around starting that conversation. Um, one aspect that I think kind of really ties into that is, I've got lost what my thought went. I'll come back to you when I've got that thought back. But I had a good thought, and I'll be back in a second. <laughs> yeah, you can see the, the ADHD dyslexic tendencies really coming into play at the same time here. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Hi, thank you for this talk. It's not every day you see somebody dealing with W3, WB3 that also is concerned about accessibility as well. Far too often when I hear people talking about that space, it never comes up at all. Mm -hmm. Thank but you. Yeah. The question I do have is with some of the issues around the metaverse, I see how there are people talking about, oh, we can privatize like whole parts of it and everything. Mm -hmm. And what I worry is that can be used as a way to exclude people from participating. So how do you think with the ongoing development of the different aspects of the metaverse, W, mm -hmm. E, B, Web3 mm -hmm. and the like, how do you think uh, maybe standards, guidelines and the like can be done to ensure that that doesn't happen? Sure. Um, when we're looking at, once again, why I consider these all things as one digital convergence is I don't see a metaverse happening where you don't have Web3 elements. So you need blockchain and you need a way interoperable system that you can take assets into virtual spaces in order to create a metaverse from my perspective. How you can use it to stop exclusion is 
there are so many different use cases of how you can use it in a meaningful way. Um, for example, when we were talking about the research base yesterday and there was, a, there was in your group discussion, they'd said, oh, maybe we should use blockchain as a way to be able to do that. Or they could use a federated learning system which combines the centralization of a normal model which teaches an AI, the decentralization bit that keeps that data and then goes back into a centralized model. So you can basically use data to train a model to be able to get the learning but doesn't retain any of the data which can once again lead to more people being able to participate because those people have control over their data, they have more security in it, they have more understanding of it. So when we're looking at, and I say this just as a, an example because there's so many different ways that we can change how data moves through a system in a meaningful way that can enable more participation. Um, and uh, the way that I always look about it and why it ties into the social aspect is centralization and decentralization don't necessarily produce different outcomes. Quite often people go, well, should I do this in a decentralized way or a centralized one? And the best example I can give is going, I could go to the supermarket and buy all my shopping. Come out, get everything. It's a centralized institution. They've done all the hard work for me. They've connected to the buyers, everything like that. They're going to do the markup and the profit, and I'm going to walk out the shop with my, my supermarket shopping there. From a decentralized point of view, I could also go to a marketplace and I could go around each individual vendor and each individual stall and pick up everything. And I'd still walk away with two bags of shopping. The difference is I get to decide by my purchasing power what people benefit at what point of the chain. And that is where you can once again add in an inclusive element to it is by going, how can I make sure that these assets are going to the individuals that we want them to be able to go to? And with blockchain technology, there's an authenticity and a transparency. Blockchain it, well, is much more about truth, whereas centralization is about trust. Um, and we can choose between those to kind of build inclusive systems. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that gave me some things to think about. I have a bit more to say, but I'll just contact you one-on-one. -on -one. Perfect. Yeah, I think we're just about due to start our next panel. But thanks so much, Jamie. That was a fantastic talk. Great conversation. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And um, yeah, I would certainly encourage everyone to continue uh, chatting on, on the symposium Slack.